12, 11, Oh, I think it says 10. that we're live. Nope, it's almost 8, 7. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another live show. I am here with my editor, Alex. So two Alexes Hello. here at Alex and Autos. Uh, that was definitely part of the hiring process. You can only <laughs> be hired here if your name is Alex. And she will be assisting me in reading off questions, uh, in dealing with our raffle, of course. Uh, we had a lot more responses than I thought we were going to get, so we may need a bigger hat in future if we do it this time. Um, and because uh, we printed them all on little slips of paper to make it seem better. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Uh, at any rate, so there are 650 of you here in this hat. Someone just escaped, so we'll shuffle that along. I'll let Alex uh -huh. shuffle that in the hat so we can try and be as fair as possible. Uh, I want to thank everybody that sent in the email as I had asked with your name and then address on three separate lines with no additional descriptions because we had to transfer all those, print them out, cut them into all these little strips and then stick them here in the hat. So that's how this process is going to go. And our first giveaway, here's how this is going to work, <clears throat> is going to be the citation one here. So this is a uh, Google home speaker made by Harman Kardon. Uh, this particular one, I believe, comes courtesy of Kia. So anyway, yes. so that's how that's going to go. And uh, if for some reason you wrote in and you specifically said you wanted something else, when we pull your name out of the hat, then you won't get this. You'll get what you requested unless it has already been taken. So that's how this process is going to work. Sound right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. So... Uh, my lovely assistant will now pull a name out of the hat at random. Oh, the first one, the pressure. Employees and family members <laughs> not eligible. Do you want me to read it or are you going to read it? I will read it here, I guess. Thank you. And uh, so Brandon Thompson from West Sacramento. Oh. That's good because shipping is going to be cheap yeah, on that one. Down. So uh, I just realized that I left my tape somewhere else. So let me grab it here. <laughs> So we are going to tape your name to the appropriate one, and uh, I will send you an email to confirm that the shipping address is correct. Uh, the email actually may come from Alex right over here on Monday. So if you want anything, then it will be on Monday. And uh, now we're going to go to the questions before we pick another name out of the hat. Okay. Because we have to make people wait. Oh, You have to stay interested in, and uh, anticipating for the entire show. Okay, so we have a question from Jimmy. He wants to know, should he wait for the 2020 Toyota Camry hybrid or go ahead with the 2020 Corolla hybrid? Oh, interesting. Uh, I would probably Camry hybrid, to be honest. I was a little bit disappointed in the Corolla hybrid. The fuel economy is good, but the fuel economy in the Camry is exceptional, really, for the size of the vehicle. It's an awful lot more comfortable. Um, it feels better. Um, and you can get more premium options in the Camry. The one thing I really disliked about the Corolla Hybrid is it's available only in the one trim, uh, and it's pr pretty darn slow. It's, you know, the Prius drivetrain jammed into the Corolla, and somehow or another, um, the more powerful hybrid system in the Camry gets about the same fuel economy. So that's what I'd do. Next. Um, what's a better buy, a loaded RAV4 or an all-wheel drive Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, what's a better buy? Loaded RAV4 Limited or all-wheel drive V6 Camry? I don't think I'm understanding that question right. Oh, oh right. loaded loaded, loaded RAV4 all-wheel drive. There we go. Oh, there so, we go. Um, that's a tricky one. Better value. Generally speaking, in the, in the modern market, um, sedans are going to be the better value because you're going to... Uh, crossovers are hot right now. Everybody seems to want a crossover. So generally, you'll get the same or similar stuff in the sedan for less than the crossover. So a good example there, um, out not, not specifically Toyota's, but would be something like a Mazda CX-5 and the Mazda 3 hatchback all-wheel drive. Uh, you'll get much more stuff in the Mazda 3 for less than you would in a CX-5 or even a CX-3. So, um, yeah, like tricky. I like the Mazda 3. Um, no, we are not giving away a car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any thoughts on the Chev on the Chevrolet Trail Boss? The Chevrolet Trail Boss. Um, I think I'll wait until we till we see more on that one. I think would be the best best um, best thing to do there. Um, you know, we're we're expecting a lot out of out of GM and Ford this year. Perhaps LA, maybe January. 
Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens when they come. Okay, this isn't like a specific question, but any info on the next gen Sienna? Toyota's been really tight-lipped, but I think the bigger deal is that um, the Sienna doesn't sell as well as the Chrysler minivans. So no, and even Chrysler doesn't spend too much money uh, too often on redesigning their minivans. They're just not high selling vehicles. Um, and the Sienna sales don't really seem to be affected by the fact that it's really old. So until sales start to slip, you know, I don't think we're gonna see Toyota really pushing too hard on a Sienna redesign. Um, the biggest move in the minivan segment right now seems to be the possibility that FCA may put all-wheel drive on the Pacifica. Um, but other than that, we're not really seeing a lot there on, on the minivan front. Um, I'm seeing a number of tire questions come through all of a sudden, so I'll just sort of dive into those just real quick. Um, Do you want so, me to come to you or are you going to? Well, that's okay. okay. I can sort of summarize them. I've seen, okay. seen them pop up here. Um, so generally speaking, generally speaking, the wider the tire you have, uh, the better the handling you will get on a car. Now, it's it's not always so linear because the the tire si the entire tire size uh, and the weight of the vehicle does have an impact on there. So your aspect ratio, the wheel size, the tire width, etc. Um, the those all play into the contact patch on the ground. And there are some online contact patch calculators that you can use, but basically what you would want is you would want a bigger contact patch on the ground for better handling. Generally speaking, you'd want a smaller contact patch on the ground to improve overall fuel efficiency because it's going to reduce your resistance. Um, and then tire, so, tire compounds play into this uh, as well. So if you have a tire compound that's specifically designed to lower rolling resistance, you're going to get better fuel economy. If you have one that's really targeted towards grip, whatever the situation is, whether that's wet grip, dry grip, or winter and snow grip, uh, you're going to end up lowering your fuel efficiency because grip is the target and that means an increase in friction. So um, it really depends on your particular preferences. And when we're talking about tires that come with a vehicle from the factory, oftentimes manufacturers will work with tire companies to, um, to create specific blends that are targeted for them and their vehicle to highlight the things that they want about that car. So for a luxury car, it could be a focus on handling or on cabin noise or ride quiet. And the, the two may, may conflict, so they, they may give up one for the other. Whereas with a performance vehicle, they're not gonna care as much about fuel economy or tire noise, so they're gonna be targeting uh, grip to improve acceleration and braking and handling, that sort of thing. So uh, next question. What is Ford's track record on reliability for plug-in hybrids? Ford's been pretty good on the plug-in hybrid front. Um, the big thing to remember is that Ford's hybrids, General Motors hybrids, FCA's hybrids, which would be the Chrysler Pacifica and some upcoming hybrids, uh, and Toyota's hybrids all use the exact same uh, general basic operating principle. So, um, and this I've covered before. They're really quite simple devices. Sorry, we have previous notes on that page. Um, really quite basic devices. So it's a planetary gear set. So what we have here, and this varies based on each manufacturer's independent design, is we have a sun gear, and this could be connected to the engine. And then we have a planetary gear carrier, like that, and those are connected together. And the carrier could be connected to a one motor generator unit, say MG1, and then there's a ring gear all the way around this contraption that could be connected to MG2, for instance, right like that. And so this is all that there is going on inside a Ford and a Toyota and a General Motors and an FCA hybrid system. So it's one planetary gear set. You compare that to a modern eight speed automatic transmission, it could have four uh, gear set, four planetary gear sets, uh, clutches, et cetera, going on in there. It's gonna have a, a, a mechanism to engage reverse as well. Um, with this kind of hybrid system, you don't have that. So you know, MG2 may be directly connected to the wheels. So on the car, whatever we call that right there. And if you wanna go backwards, we spin this motor backwards. If you wanna go forwards in EV mode, you spin it forwards. So there's very little to go wrong in, in those modern hybrid systems. And that's really something that we've seen um, out of uh, Ford's original hybrid designs. For instance, the Ford Escape hybrid being used as a taxi in New York City. 
Um, they've got Ford Escape hybrids in New York City with over 300,000 miles on the original battery, on the original transmission, on the original engine, etc. Um, so I wouldn't have any particular worries. The only thing that's specific to the plug-in hybrids of Ford is the bigger battery and the charger. And again, those are solid state components. So generally speaking, they're not going to have any longevity problems. There we go. And moving right along, what is our next question I feel question like I know here? what you're going to say, but what minivan is good for value, for money, and reliable? Um, reliability is a tricky one here. So, you know, if, you are, if you're one of the people that, that wants absolute reliability, then you should go probably with the Toyota minivan, which I would say, or actually the Kia minivan. Let me rephrase that. So the Toyota or the Kia, they have the highest, uh, best track record for reliability in the minivan segment. Um, the Honda Odyssey, oddly enough, uses the same transmission as the Chrysler Pacifica. A lot of people dislike the way that transmission feels out on the road. It hasn't really been a true reliability problem. But if you're worried about transmission reliability, know that those two are going to be in the same boat. Um, but in terms of overall value, the Chrysler Pacifica is really hard to beat. Uh, and if you are talking about absolute bargain basement value, then the old Dodge uh, Caravan is still sold. It still exists. Um, and it's going to be crazy cheap. There are some really, really steep discounts on those, but they're new with a warranty. Um, if you want something that is a little bit more modern, but also a good value, uh, Chrysler has resurrected uh, the Voyager name, I believe. I might be getting that wrong, but I believe they've resurrected the Voyager name. Uh, they're calling it something. Let's put it that way. They have resurrected a discount minivan name, and I'm sure someone will tell me what it is down there in the comment section below. I believe it's the Voyager. Anyway, it's going to also be thousands of dollars less than the Sienna or the Pacific or the Odyssey rather. Um, the big deal here would be, is the Chrysler minivan um, by the numbers going to be as reliable? No, probably not. But over the lifetime of the vehicle, say 10 years, you're unlikely to spend $5,000 more in repairs on the Chrysler minivan than you would on the Honda minivan, so you'll still be saving money on the Chrysler. So that's how that goes. Um, I knew you'd shall go we the pull a number, another name out of the hat? Yes. Here we go. Do you want to do, you want to do it this time? Okay, I will, I will reach for one. Let's see. Oh, oh wait, someone said it. it? Someone said it, it was. Oh, what are we doing? Here we go. We will do it for the Subaru jacket. Let's uh, let's make this interesting. Okay, so rather than starting it with the best prizes first. So we have the Subaru jacket, has a little hood on there. Um, it's a very lightweight jacket and it does have Subaru right here on an arm somewhere. Side. There we go, on that arm right there. So I will go ahead and pull one out here. Hopefully this is a Subaru fan somewhere out there. And unfortunately this is a large jacket. It's only in one size. Uh, this is going to Dodie Lee of Soquel, California. Oh. They that. live. They live right near me. So I'm close. happy about that. <laughs> so, and we're in Subaru country out there in SoCal. So that that works. Hey, so I will pocket or tape it. I will put that. I will try to keep those together. Exactly. Anyway, so congratulations to uh, that person there who Adoti, I believe. Am I getting that name right? Sorry if I'm pronouncing everybody's name wrong. And now let's dive into the next question. Um, do you prefer the Volkswagen cockpit or the Mazda HUD? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I like. I have to say, I mean, the heads-up display is great, but um, I would rather have the big LCD instrument cluster. I think it's cooler looking. Would you recommend a loaded subcompact car or a mid-grade trim compact car? I want climate control and satellite radio. Um, I would say, you know, it depends on how much you plan on ever using the back seat. Um, there are a lot of subcompact cars out there that are going to be great values. And you are, as you pointed out, going to get more equipment in the subcompact for the same price as the compact. Um, you can look at some of the new sort of segment busting ones in there, um, like the new Versa, which is, you know, almost as big as a compact, um, but still technically a subcompact. Um, I think the new Versa looks good in that category. Um, I also think that the, uh, the new Kia Rio comes across as a very grown up looking subcompact car. Um, but I would also say that you may want to look at a subcompact crossover. Those end up being a little bit more practical and they're relatively similarly priced. If you could, if you're debating that, that distance between subcompact and compact car. Um, okay. Garrett would like to know, he's looking for a reasonably priced sporty crossover and is considering the 2020 Acura RDX. 
um, versus the 2020 Subaru Outback XT. How do their driving dy dynamics differ? Is the Acura worth the extra money? Oh, interesting question. Yeah, so very different in driving dynamics. The RDX is much sportier, it's much firmer, it's tighter, um, it feels a lot smaller out on the road. Um, it has uh, Acura's super handling all-wheel drive system, which can send more than 50% of engine power to the rear. So if you, for instance, crank the steering wheel and floor it, the RDX will uh, have the rear end kick out like a rear-wheel drive car can, um, because it can send up to 70% of power to the rear axle. Uh, the Subaru Outback XT, a lot of folks misinterpret uh, or, or misunderstand Subaru's all-wheel drive message. All Subarus have all-wheel drive, and Subaru's all-wheel drive systems are generally good, but the Subaru all-wheel drive system is not going to be as ostensibly capable as the Acura all-wheel drive system. It will, for instance, never send more than 50% of engine power to the rear axle unless there is slip on the front axle. Um, and even if there is complete slip on the front axle, it cannot send 100% of engine power to the rear just because of its overall design. Uh, there's no locking method uh, on the center coupling like we find in some uh, other crossovers out there, and there's no mechanical limited slip functionality on the rear differential like there would be uh, in the Acura RDX. So uh, depending on exactly what you're looking at, the Outback is going to be the better deal. Um, it's definitely going to be a better value, and I also thought it was very comfortable. Um, but the RDX is probably going to be more fun. Uh, and remember, of course, you're paying a little bit uh, for brand. So Acura is you know, a, a discount luxury brand, but it's still not a mainstream brand, so you're still going to pay more for comparable features in it than you would in a Honda. Um, and Honda's the brand that would really uh, interact with Subaru there. So uh, moving right along. Okay, what is better to get, a two-year used luxury midsize SUV or a new Kia Telluride? Ooh, tricky question, uh, the used the used question. I like the um, Telluride. You did like the Telluride, didn't, didn't you? Telluride. Yeah, she drove the Telluride. Um, a used luxury SUV, remember that it's going to cost you more in maintenance and repairs and insurance. So even though it could be as, as cost effective initially as a new car, keep that in mind. Also keep in mind the financing deals on a used luxury car may not be as good. So if you're financing the vehicle, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and you're also not gonna get the latest in technology. So depending on the exact luxury car you're getting, you may be missing things like uh, the autonomous braking system, adaptive cruise control, um, you may be missing Apple CarPlay or Android Auto support, things like that, that you will find. I, I would say not just in the Telluride, but, but also in, in most of the entries in that segment that are new. So whether you're looking at that or the new Explorer, comparably priced Explorer, or Mazda CX-9, or the new 2020 Highlander, um, those will generally have those features at that price. Since you mentioned Explorer, uh, what do you think of the now previous gen Explorer's naturally aspirated 3.5 V6? I always thought it was fine. Um, none of the entries in that segment are overly exciting. I thought that their turbocharged V6 was much nicer, um, but nothing particularly wrong with that with that engine overall. Which would you choose, BMW 330 or Audi A5? Um, I would probably 330. What's a good small car that's not a slug? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Most small cars are slugs. Um, and the main reason for that is corporate average fuel economy. As we've said before, the smaller the car, the higher the fuel economy has to be in order to meet average fuel economy standards. So when we're looking at small, small, there really is nothing in the subcompact space that's terribly exciting, to be honest, Other, outside of some luxury entries like a Mini. You can get a small Mini with a lot more power. Um, you can also get something like, um, uh, you know, a Civic SI, the, uh, the two door SI is going to be fast, fun and small ish. It's still a compact car, but the coupe is smaller than the rest of the, the Civic lineup. Outside of that, you're really just looking at things like, uh, the Elantra Sport, the Forte GT, uh, the Focus is dead. Um, there is no General Motors uh, compact sedan that's that's sporty. Um, well, there's no General Motors compact sedan. Um, so that's that's pretty much going to be it. Um, outside of that, you could look in the luxury segment, but um, not too much else. Uh, do you think the BMW or do you think BMW will bring over the 5 Series Touring now that it's getting rid of the Gran Turismo? 
doubt it. Wagons are wagons don't sell well in America. Volvo is the best selling wagon purveyor in the luxury segment, um, and wagons just don't sell. Um, except if the if you're an Outback, the Subaru Outback is the only only Subaru only wagon period in North America that outsells its sedan counterpart, and it sell, outsells by a huge margin. But you'll notice that Subaru never ever calls it a wagon. So. Um, my family wants to purchase a large luxury luxury SUV. What would be your recommendation? Um, I guess it would depend on what. I guess I would know need to know what size and and what your budget is because there's so many good options out there right now. Um, I have to say that I really like the new BMW X5 and X7. Uh, those that pair just has the interior is very very well done. They're very comfortable. They're fast. They're uh, relatively efficient for what they are. They're very quiet inside. Um, I would also say that the uh, you should look at the new uh, Audi Q7 if you're willing to wait. Audi is redesigning that for 2020 or significantly refreshing it for 2020. Um, and then the Lincoln Aviator, um, I have to say, looks incredibly good. Haven't had the chance to drive it. Hopefully we will be driving it soon. Um, but it looks really, really good. And if it drives anything like the new Ford Explorer, I think that's going to be an incredible deal. Um, it's less than the Cadillac XT6, so it's um, more Volvo XC90 priced. Um, but uh, in terms of driving dynamics, it really is more X5 and GLE. Okay. Do you lose power with all-wheel drive versus two-wheel drive? Lose power is a tricky question there. Generally, no, you don't lose power, but there can be some additional driveline inefficiencies. Anytime you're spinning more things, um, you're going to add a little bit of extra loss into the driveline. So the engine's going to still produce the same amount of power in most designs. Um, <clears throat> now, there have been a few vehicles out there when uh, they add all-wheel drive, they change the exhaust routing so the, the engine produces more or less power depending on what they've done. But generally speaking, that's going to be the same. You're just going to have additional uh, drivetrain losses and then the additional weight. So that's the reason we see lower fuel economy in all-wheel drive vehicles versus the two-wheel drive model is uh, the double whammy of the extra 250 to 300 pounds or so that the all-wheel drive system adds and then the extra loss of, of these parts moving around. Okay, why do some manufacturers like BMW or Honda underrate their engines and not brands like Toyota or Lexus? That just seems to be a marketing decision. Um, no one's really sure why BMW does it. I think BMW um, generally wants to be sure that, um, that when the press tests their vehicles, that they get the performance that BMW is claiming. So BMW will say, you know, we produce X, Y, and Z, and we're going to, you know, we call this a 4.5 second zero to 60 car. They want to make sure that at sea level on a cold day that you're way below that time. So that way when Motor Trend tests in the desert in Los Angeles, you know, at 100 degrees, that it's still going to get at least the advertised time. Um, whereas other manufacturers just tend to be very engineering focused, very literal. Um, and Toyota seems to be one of those companies where they say, well, it's, if it's 200 horsepower, that's definitely 200 horsepower. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, some companies practice torque limiting. So it may be that the engine does produce um, whatever horsepower or torque rating we see on the sticker, but maybe it doesn't produce it in first gear. Maybe it doesn't produce it in second gear. Uh, or maybe uh, the manufacturer is really pulling back on torque between gear shifts in order to improve overall transmission lifetime. Uh, and we see that in a wide variety of vehicles out there. So, um, for instance, uh, if we take a look at Ford's front wheel drive EcoBoost products, I think those are a perfect example of this. Uh, the previous generation Explorer, the Edge ST, uh, the Lincoln Continental. Um, there's a pretty severe torque limit in first and second gear to, to prevent from damaging anything because those engines can produce so much. Um, and then we see something very similar in, in the Kia and the Genesis line in their rear wheel drive vehicles. And I think they're doing that mainly there for warranty. So if you have a 10 year, 100,000 mile powertrain warranty and you've got a car that people are really gonna drive hard, you wanna make sure that that transmission will last 10 years, 100,000 miles. Um, so they limit torque in first gear. And that's really obvious when you look at the Stinger and the G70 with the 3.3 liter V6 um, and look at the acceleration times from zero to 30 and then 30 to 60. 30 to 60 happens really darn fast, but zero to 30 is a little bit slower than you might think. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, my family is expecting our first baby next year. Congratulations. What car with HOV sticker do you recommend that's below 50K? Car with HOV stickers. Um, <clears throat> you're really going to be in in the mainstream segment there. Actually, the Clarity, I think, that we have this week is, is going to be a good option. Um, the Clarity gets high marks for safety. Um, it is comfortable on the inside. It's roomy. It has a big trunk. Uh, it's a mid-size sedan, so overall it's going to give you that, that larger sedan feeling that a lot of people seem to like. Um, the looks are a little questionable. Uh, I have to say that the Clarity and the Pacifica Hybrid are my two favorite mainstream plug-in hybrids. One for the three-row people and one for the two-row sedan people. But the Clarity is not the most attractive thing that Honda has ever designed. Um, but the best part about being inside the Clarity is that you can't see the outside from the inside. It's True. Great, great reason to buy one. Um, and the interior is really, really well done. It like is really I, nice. I think that the Clarity's interior should have been in an Acura somewhere. Arguably, I like the interior of the Clarity more than the current generation TLX or RLX from Acura. It's a really, really well done interior. Um, outside of those options, um, Obviously, there's the Prius Prime. It's probably going to be very, very reliable, very efficient all the way around. Not terribly exciting. Um, and the reason I think that the Clarity is my top pick here is because when you price it up against the Prius Prime and the Kia Niro and the Hyundai Ioniq and the Subaru Crosstrek and all those other options there, the, uh, the Clarity performs very, very well in that lineup in terms of value and pricing. It gets the full $7,500 tax credit, not some of the shortened credits that we see in the other plug-in hybrids. So keep that in mind while you're looking at the price tags online. Um, it has a long electric range, which is really going to help you if you, uh, if you can keep your travel within that range. Um, and then the, the leasing rates on it are pretty cheap as well in California. And I noticed someone else just asked a question about Honda limiting the clarity to California. So this is an interesting question. So um, we were going to do a segment on best plug-in hybrid in America. So I rang up Honda and I said, hey, send me a clarity. They found one. They dug one out of mothballs. They sent me a clarity. So we could do this segment on best plug-in hybrid in America. And the day we were shooting the video, Honda announced that they were pulling back uh, clarity dealer pushes outside of California. So this is a little tricky. So some have reported that the Clarity is not available outside of California. That's not technically correct. What Honda has said is that it is available for order in all 50 states. So if you're in Alaska or Hawaii or New York or Florida, uh, any corner of the US, you can go to your Honda dealer and you can order a plug-in hybrid Clarity. Now you cannot order a battery Clarity or a fuel cell Clarity outside of California. But the plug-in hybrid, you can. You can get it delivered to your local dealer, take delivery of it there. Shouldn't take too long because they're going to be hanging out in California. They'll be able to ship you one. Um, dealers, if they really want one, dealers can also place their own dealer orders, which was something that was confusing initially, but we confirmed with Honda that that was the case. So for instance, if there's a dealer in New York and that New York dealer really wants to have some clarities on the lot, they can order them as well but they're no longer really pushing any dealers to take Clarity. So before they were trying to get dealers to take Clarities to have them on the lot, and now they're not. Dealers have to want them or you have to order them. So that's how that's gonna go. So let's answer our super chat now. Okay, Patrick is asking for two adults, a medium dog, maybe a baby. Should they look into the 2018 CRV Touring, the 2019 Santa Fe Limited, or the 2018 Forester XT or something else? Gotcha. Well, thanks for the super chat there, Patrick. Uh, let me look at the options again. $30,000. Um, I would tend to lean towards the Santa Fe, um, mainly because of the maybe baby part. So if you're maybe babying, then the rear facing child seat is of prime importance. If you've already babied, then maybe you have a kid in a forward facing child seat. And these are two very different situations. So especially if you're taller people, trying to put a rear facing child seat behind someone in a CRV or in the Forester, even though they're relatively large as far as compact crossovers go, there's just not as much room as there is in a midsize crossover. So the Santa Fe is definitely bigger on the inside uh, than those options. So that's where I would tend to go. As far as overall value goes, they're definitely excellent. Um, all three of those are pretty decent value options there. 
Um, I would say that you know you might want to take a look at something like a new Rav4 Limited though. Uh, if you're taking a look at them in, in that category, new RAV4 Limited or perhaps the RAV4 Hybrid um, Premium, uh, XLE Premium package, um, it's not going to be quite as big. Again, if you're a taller person, that's not going to work, but 40 miles per gallon is, is pretty tasty and it's hard to go wrong, I think, with, with the new RAV4 Hybrid. As you buy the RAV4 Hybrid. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. Oh, I want to buy a fun, fast, and affordable V8. Can you give me options? Okay, I will just V8. I was going to answer this question that popped up right here because someone asked something about the Rav4 Hybrid, as I just mentioned it. So we didn't order an XSE; we ordered an XLE because I think the XSE front on the Rav4 is a little funny looking. I don't like it. I like the Adventure front end actually the most, and I really want a hybrid with that same front end on it. At any rate, we ordered the XLE hybrid for long-term testing ages and ages and ages ago. Um, because of the way that we ordered it, as in actually saying, factory, please build me one, um, it's taking a really, really long time, like an unquest, an astronomically long time, to be perfectly honest, like unfathomably long. Longer than the Tesla? Hope Longer than the Tesla. <laughs> the Tesla was quick. So hopefully no one else is experiencing this, although Toyota is selling far more RAV4 hybrids than they expected, and they are having part shortages as a result for production. Um, so supposedly ours is on a boat somewhere and maybe it will be here this month, but we don't know exactly. Let's uh, do the affordable one and then we'll draw some more names. So affordable V8, I would say my top pick on affordable V8 uh, sedan at the moment uh, that's fun would probably be something like the Chrysler 300. I like the interior a little bit better than the Dodge Charger. Um, it's V8 rear wheel drive. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, they're fun. Um, it's a big car. It's that cl the only classic rear wheel drive American car left. Um, if you're willing to step outside the V8 category, um, then I would say take a look at something like uh, the Kia Stinger. Um, if you want smaller than that, then definitely Mustang. I would Mustang before I Camaroed. Um, I would Mustang before I Challengered. Uh, if you want something fun. If you want something that's fun and practical, the Challenger is an interesting combo since it's the only two-door American coupe that has five seats. Um, and the back seats are usable for humans, um, but it is big. I mean, you drive the Mustang and the Challenger back to back and one is gonna feel like you know a really tight shoe and the other one is gonna feel like a flipper you know, in comparison to the other. So uh, definitely keep that in mind. So without that, let's go to the hat. I have the hat. The hat, okay. I will mix and you can pick. Oh, it's my turn to pick. You can pick and then you pick and I will pick something off the wall. Where are we? What are we giving away? We are giving away the Schnazzy Recycled Battery Pack, a backpack rather, a uh, backpack courtesy of Hyundai. It has a little Hyundai sticker there. Uh, this is a United by Blue and it's a responsible recycled material backpack. Okay. So who have we? Do you we? want me to read it or do you want to sure, read it? Sure, go ahead and read it. Eric Saunders. Um, from Nebraska. Oh, he wanted the backpack too. Yay! That's perfect. Yay. Even when it got what you wanted. Yeah. I'm glad that somebody oh, got what sure. they wanted. There we go. So we will, Somewhere. again, we will be emailing you on Monday. You are tagged for the backpack and we'll just dive right into a thermos too. Why not? Okay. Get these two done out of the way here early. Uh, we have Ooh, that's a, nice a one. Mazda thermos. That is quite a nice one. That's how that lid works there. Oh. There's a Mazda tag in there. It's from the Mazda collection, in case you didn't... Uh, Authenticity. In case you didn't know, yes. The Mazda... I wonder what, what else is in the <laughs> Mazda collection. I don't know. Uh, shall I pick this time? No. Okay. I guess I won't just pick one right off the top. That <laughs> seems wrong, doesn't it? Seems like I should dig a little bit more. Uh, here we go. I have one here, and this is Jeremy Schwartz from Comac, New York. So congratulations on the Mazda Thermos. Again, we will email you about that on Monday. And then on to the next question. Okay. Can we use low mode in Subaru Forester and drive up to 70 miles per hour during the drive in mountain roads? Yes, because when the, the low mode they're talking about is really just a low ratio mode. So it's really just telling the CVT, you know, I'd rather hang out at this ratio than that ratio. So there's really no additional wear on anything. Um, the, the engine had, would have a little bit, of, a little bit of additional wear, perhaps statistically, but short term, um, 100,000 miles or so, it's not gonna make a difference. Are you excited for the possible Ford Bronco? 
I am. I'm interested about that one. And, and you know, what exactly is it going to be? Uh, so many questions with that. It looks cool. It looks interesting. Will they be able to resurrect the, the brand loyalty and the sales that the Bronco had? Because the Bronco used to sell really well. So, I don't know. Open question. Uh, Palisade or 2020 Highlander? Um, depends on what you're looking for. They're very different vehicles, I would say. Um, I want to buy a truck, and in a few years, I'm thinking to purchase a fifth wheel trailer to tow. What truck would you suggest? Ooh, fifth wheel. So, uh, let us be sure to let me know how heavy that fifth wheel is down there in the question comment section below. Um, hopefully, we will see your answer pop up as we babble along here about towing, um, so that way I can direct this in the right way. Um, I would say the first thing to keep in mind is uh, when fifth wheel towing in California and a number of other states, your maximum uh, allowable tow is 15,000 pounds. And you need a special endorsement for your license, for your Class C license to tow over 10,000 pounds. So if, you're, if your fifth wheel is in this window, 10 to 15,000 pounds, keep that in mind. If you're, and this may sound like a bash on California, but it is actually not. California is, is arguably one of the more liberal states when it comes to towing. If you're fifth wheel towing in Texas or about 20 other states in the US, then you have to keep gross combined weight rating in mind. And that is a little bit trickier because what those states say is that the, the combined weight rating of your truck and the combined weight rating of your trailer together must be under a certain amount. Um, so this, this is where you need to be really careful when selecting half ton, three quarter ton, or one ton truck. So if you're out there shopping for a Ram 2500, an F250, or a Silverado 2500, or GMC Sierra 2500, all four of those vehicles could have a GVWR of 14 to 15,000 pounds. Um, and that means that your allowable tow rating uh, is gonna be pretty low. So in a fifth wheel in Texas, if you had a 15,000 uh, GVWR truck towing, you can only tow 11,000 pounds legally on a fifth wheel. So those weights are definitely very, very important to keep in mind. Um, if this is a lighter fifth wheel, then I would definitely get something like a Ram 1500. I'd say in the half ton segment, the Ram 1500 is definitely my top choice. Uh, I'm giving away a little bit of the game here uh, with an upcoming video that we're going to be releasing about two weeks or so. Um, is that the Ram 2500, I was a little bit disappointed in. So I think if you're half ton truck shopping, at the moment, uh, I would definitely Ram 1500. It's it's a good value. It's a great truck. Um, best interior in the segment. A lot of practical features that I think are really great too, especially for towing. Um, the it has a the blind spot monitoring system in the Fords and in the Ram trucks are the only ones that will recognize the trailer and adjust appropriately uh, for blind spots of the trailer. Um, but when you mo move up into the three quarter ton and one ton trucks. Uh, I, the Ram, I think, loses the advantage here. Um, the new Silverado uh, mechanically has some great things going on with the new 10-speed, their new V8 engine, the towing apps that we find in that vehicle, they're great. Uh, the new upcoming Ford Super Duty trucks, hopefully we'll be able to drive those later this year. Uh, same thing going on, new transmissions, new engines, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, and again, towing features, I think, are, are better in that. For some reason, the Ram 2500's blind spot monitoring system, for instance, won't recognize blind spots of the trailer connected because it didn't get the new system from the 1500. So there's that right there. And then I will just pull this one up here about uh, Travis's Voltec technology. Um, thank you for the, the, the chat there, Travis. Um, doo -doo -doo, will it live on or a plug-in hybrids we sunsetted? That's tricky. And I think the tricky thing for GM and the Voltec was that it was definitely very popular, but it's also expensive. Um, so I think that it will live on in regular hybrids. Whether or not GM is going to make more plug-in hybrids, I don't know. Um, that's that's a tough one. They've kind of sort of committed to it. Um, but you'll notice that the Cadillac plug-in hybrid is gone from America at the moment. Um, it was built in China. That's part of the problem. Um, you know, But we may see more systems on, um, on rear-wheel drive vehicles in the luxury segment where maybe they could command extra dollars for that, like we see out of BMW and Mercedes and Volvo, et cetera. But I don't know if we're going to see anything quite like a Volt again. I think that GM's probably going to spend a little bit more on, on EVs. Any word when you may get to test drive the upcoming Toyota Highlander, gas and hybrid? Um, we are. It is our understanding that the Highlander will not be um, test driven until December of this year. So quite surprised by that because it was announced quite a while ago 
But um, but Toyota at that time was pretty clear that it would be fall to winter 2019 when we would actually be driving it. And it probably won't be on sale until January of 2020. So it's probably going to follow a pretty similar form to the RAV4. The RAV4 was announced in 2018. Um, the drive program was very, very late 2018. And then sales happened in January with hybrid sales happened following a few months later. Probably the same thing with the Highlander. You're gonna get the gas version first, the hybrid version uh, a few months later, and probably all in the 2020 calendar year. Any 2020 Ridgeline news? Nope, no 2020 Ridgeline news at all. Um, Honda's pretty tight-lipped on their news, and and the uh, the Ridgeline, it, that's a question mark there because they haven't announced any redesign for the major components in the Ridgeline. It hasn't been on sale too long, and the Ridgeline hasn't exactly set the sales charts on fire. So I don't know if there are going to be too many changes there, um, which I think is a little unfortunate because I really like the Ridgeline. I think that the Ridgeline is 99% of the truck that 99% of Americans need, but for some reason, only about 5% of what people want. Seems like nobody wants nobody wants the front wheel drive truck. Um, you know, nobody wants the you know the girly truck. I guess for lack of a better word, that's what people would want to call it. But mm -hmm. I like the Ridgeline. I think that if the Ridgeline could tow. 7,000 pounds, that is exactly the kind of truck that I would buy. The towing rating is the only problem for me in that one, but uh, anybody that lives in a suburban or urban area, it's so practical. The The trunk in the bed, I mean, you lift the lift the bed, there's a trunk under there. Um, it handles well. The fuel economy is good. It's priced right. I can't, I can't complain about the Ridgeline. Um, what's your guess on when Ford will make the next significant interior update on the F-150? That's a good question. Ford tends to do the TikTok thing, so they will update the interiors and then they'll update the engine lineup. Um, so I suspect that all of this noise that we're hearing about the new drive lines and the new engines and everything for the Ford Super Duty trucks is sort of the precursor to the F-150's redesign, kind of backwards from what we saw when they last got refreshed. So I'm going to go ahead and assume, mind you, just my own assumption, that we're going to see this, this, this heavily refreshed Super Duty lineup with the new engines, and then the next thing that we'll see out of Ford would be a refreshed F-150, um, since they just gave us new transmissions under the hood and some new engines not that long ago, I'm assuming that the engines will remain the same and that we'll get a new body and a new interior uh, wrapped around it possibly coinciding with the rumors of an electrified F-150. My personal thought on that one, there are a lot of rumors about an electric F-150. Uh, my personal thought on that is that it's probably gonna be a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid because we know that those systems are already ready. We don't know um, if, if there is already a full EV system ready for use. Uh, there's a Rivian tie-up, you know, the Rivian pickup truck right back here. Um, Ford and Rivian have hooked up and there is going to be some Ford thing on the Rivian skateboard, but I suspect that we're going to see a plug-in hybrid system um, using the the Explorer and Aviator hybrid system first. Want to dive back into the hat? We will dive back into the hat for another <laughs> Google exist, uh, Assistant. Um, this one is courtesy of Hyundai, so thank you Hyundai for the uh, the Google Assistant here and Carmen Carden speaker. Are you picking this one? Or uh, okay, I can pick this one. Sure, why not? And this one is Gustavo Newman from New York, New York. So congratulations on the Google Assistant. Again, we will be contacting you on Monday for that one. I'll move this along and go ahead and pick another name and we'll give away something okay. random here. We will give away a schnazzy Alex on Auto's t-shirt. Ooh. The same one I am wearing now. But not this one, this one's custom. <laughs> so that we can choose your size. So we will email you on Monday. You'll tell us your size if you haven't already told us, and then we will ship can it on to it? you. Can I read it? You can. Okay. John Maruru from Huntington Beach. Congratulations on the t-shirt. We will be emailing you. We will be. And I will just stick this here and label shirt. There we go. On to the next question. Okay. It's simple. Will you review the Refresh 2020 XC90? We are. So I will be driving that in two weeks, I think. Maybe a week. Like week a and a half. Yeah. My next my next few weeks are going to be very confused here. So there will be no live show for the next three weeks or so. I have a wedding and a ton of different drive things to go to. So, I could um, do the, the live show. You could. <laughs> there will no. be an, an Alex <laughs> on the live show. No. Um, any new word on Santa Cruz? 
know if that's... Oh, the Santa Cruz, the Hyundai Santa Cruz. Uh, unless I'm confusing my manufacturers. No, there has been no news. Uh, CX-5 Signature or RAV4 Hybrid Limited? Ooh, tricky. I do like the Turbo and the CX-5, and I think I'm really torn between those two models. CX-5 handles great, looks great, great interior. Um, RAV4 is is really, really efficient. The RAV4 is also likely going to be cheaper to keep around. So my practical side likes the RAV4 Hybrid. You know, my more emotional side likes the CX-5. That's a tough choice. I don't know if I have a good answer for you. I feel like this one might be hard for you. RAV4 Hybrid versus Telluride. Ooh, those are two very, very different. I mean, if you need a three row, there's only one option really there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that one either. <laughs> um, it's sort of an apples to oranges comparison. Depends on what you're really after. Um, you know, if you want the extra room, you want the extra room. The RAV4 is significantly smaller than the Telluride. Uh, so that's definitely an important thing to keep in mind. Looking to replace my 2014 CX-5, considering a Volkswagen Tiguan or the 2020 Ford Escape. Your thoughts? Ooh, that's a good question. And uh, stay tuned because I will be driving the Ford Escape in this melee of travel here soon. So uh, I believe that I will have that video out in mid-September. Now, don't expect the 2020 Escape to be on sale until late September, uh, late September, early October is my uh, my understanding. And most likely the hybrid and plug-in hybrid ones will be after that as well. So keep that scheduling in mind. Um, I'm looking to purchase a 2020 Highlander. Should I wait for the hybrid? I probably would. Um, I mean, unless Toyota has done something horribly wrong with that hybrid, I would probably lean towards that. It's not going to be the same sort of no compromises hybrid that we see in the RAV4, unfortunately. So in the RAV4, the hybrid is definitely the way to go because there's no impact on interior volume. Uh, so the interior comfort and space is identical. Um, it's only $800 more expensive than a comparable RAV4. You'll make that up in about a year and a half of driving. Um, and it's actually faster than the regular RAV4. So not only are there no compromises, there are a number of benefits as well. So likely more reliable, more fuel efficient, cheaper to keep around, etc. That's a no brainer. On the, high, on the Highlander side, um, I don't know. It's going to probably be an awful lot slower than the V6. Um, how much slower, we don't know yet. Likely it's going to have really good fuel economy, and so obviously will save you money over the V6 in the long term, but it's not going to be quite the same kind of no compromises uh, hybrid option. Um, Brian Kelly would like to know, what do you think is a better value, the Explorer ST, Aviator Reserve, or Aviator Grand Touring? Ooh, interesting. Um, I'm a little torn on the Explorer ST, and it's interesting and funny that you're asking about Aviator in the same question, because my complaint about the, uh, the Explorer ST was that you couldn't get the extra oomph with some of the nicer features that we found in the top end Platinum. There's sort of two co-end top trims on the Explorer. I would tend to go for the Aviator. I think that the Aviator is a solid package. I'm, I'm honestly shocked that Lincoln is not charging more for the Aviator than they are. It is significantly less expensive than the Cadillac XT6, but you get rear wheel drive, an extra 100 horsepower, um, and are an, a much nicer interior. So I, I really like the look of that. Um, I understand that there are going to be some aviator reviews coming out now sometime soon here. So, um, you know, I understand we're, we're live streaming at the same time as TFL car. So hi to the TFL car folks and friends over there. I'm pretty sure they're going to get to drive the aviator uh, when it launches. I know that the launch is happening soon and I have not been invited. So, hey, you know what list you're on anyway. <laughs> uh, but I did get to drive the Explorer. I'm on that list um, and the Escape, but no aviator, sadly, for here for us at Alex and Autos. Um, which I think is a pity because I really, really like the look of the Aviator. Um, and it's funny because I leased the Dodge Durango that we have because I ne we needed a new SUV back in 2018, a year ago. And so I said, well, don't worry, I will just lease one because the Aviator's coming soon and the Explorer coming soon. These will be great. These will be the perfect, uh, perfect alternatives. So when the lease is up on the Durango, I'll just hop into an Aviator or something like that, maybe an, maybe an Explorer uh, ST or something. And then the towing figures didn't uh, end up where I wanted them to be. So I'm a little sad on that. So now I can't, um, or I can't explore at any rate. Assuming the aviators are identical, um, I won't be able to, to, to use an aviator as an alternative either, but it hasn't dampened my, my uh, love for the design. So there we go. Any news on the 2020 Genesis G70, like an N-line version? Pardon me as I'm writing a no, note here. Okay. 
2020 Oh, yes, 2020. yes. Um, no changes uh, as far as we know. And um, Genesis has said that there's going to be no full N version of the products as we know them. So N line, we don't really know necessarily. I just did notice someone asked me about Type R versus Focus RS. I would say in that match up there, this pops up right here in my, my eye, couldn't couldn't say no. Um, I would Type R. The Type R is an awful lot of fun. Um, I also think it's going to have a slightly broader support community for a while in the US since the Focus RS is dead. So um, the Focus period is dead in the US. Um, so the ones that they have now are pretty much going to be it. I believe sales uh, production has either stopped or will be stopping soon, one or the other. Um, but the Type R is continuing, so I would Type R probably. I think the Focus RS is better looking, but the Type R is better driving. Uh, and I like the way the clutch and the uh, and the manual transmission feel better in the Honda. It's a little bit more forgiving as well. Um, so let's pull another name out of the hat here, and we will give away another T-shirt. So here's another winner of the Alex on Autos t-shirt. Uh, there is a back as well. I suppose I could have turned around, but there we go. Real detailed reviews because, you know, we're very original here at Alex on Autos. That was all I could come up with at the moment. <laughs> so this t-shirt goes to Amar Pawar from Folsom, California. Oh, but, uh, oh, no, sorry. He had asked for a Google as a first choice, but they're all taken. So sorry, sorry, Amar. You will get a shirt and we will email you on Monday for the size. You can go ahead and pick out our next shirt winner since we were going to give away three of them. I have a lot that came out. Oh my gosh, of course. Alex Nakhili from San Diego, California. Oh, perfect name. There's, there should there be an go. extra prize for an Alex that wins the Alex on Autos prize. Uh, honorary Alex <laughs> member. I don't know. Let's see here. So uh, we'll send, we'll send you the shirt as well that sounds like a good plan our stickers in there maybe we'll put a sticker in there too Alrighty, there so there, let's on to the next question here when is the santa fe hybrid coming uh that's a good question without a good answer so um we haven't heard any any major rumors there uh it's expected but no one knows um okay uh matthew has a big decision to make. He wants to know if he should get a 2019 Honda Passport Elite or a 2019 Toyota 4Runner TRD Pro in, in Voodoo Blue. In Voodoo Blue. Two very different vehicles. Um, I That's a tough one. Neither one is necessarily my top pick in each segment. Um, hmm. Interesting, interesting. I would say maybe you should stop by the Jeep dealer and take a look at a Grand Cherokee just to be sure, just in case. Um, but uh, among those, I would probably lean towards the Pilot because it's more comfortable. Um, there's also the Passport if you want something that's a little bit more rugged looking since you're looking at two kind of, one one very not off-road and one very off-road kind of thing. That's where I'm, I'm confused here. Um, so let's see here. Um, also really consider the 2019 Jeep Grand Cherokee Trailhawk. There you go. So there we go. We have a winner. Is that the same? Is that Matthew as well? Oh, yeah. Yes, Matthew, it is. So is. Matthew, you've answered your own question. Um, that is definitely what I would do. And the re main reason for me would be because the Grand Cherokee is sort of that in between of the two options you've said. So you know, off-roady and the on-roady practical bit, but it's a lot more comfortable than the Forerunner. The Forerunner's interior has not changed in a long time, and it's not terribly modern. That's my big complaint with it. Um, so I would definitely take a look at the Jeep Grand Cherokee. It's not gonna be as reliable as the Forerunner. Um, I don't know how much that's really going to matter long-term. Again, it's you know, it's not gonna be a huge difference really. Um, but the Passport Elite, not terribly reliable on the on the engine and transmission front lately with Honda. So a little bit of an unknown there. Anyway, that's, that's definitely where I would go as well. Um, old Mustang or old Mercedes-Benz? Ooh. I guess it depends on how old the Mustang is. I do like an old Mercedes, like an old SL. I could SL. Um, Alex, what would you recommend for a first time driver who wants something small yet fun and practical? I was thinking Honda Civic or the new Toyota Corolla. I would definitely Civic. Um, I like the Corolla in general terms, um, but I think that, that Toyota missed out on a few opportunities with it. 
Um, and the Civic, the Civic, I think, is just a better buy all the way around. Um, I like the Civic sedan. The hatchback is a little funny looking, um, but um, but the sedan is lovely. Um, the coupe is also an interesting alternative since there is a two door if you don't have any other worries and you don't mind um, having that particular format there. So I would definitely look at the Civic. Um, if you want to save a little bit on fuel, the Hyundai Ioniq is in kind of a quirky little thing that you could choose. Uh, very practical as well, bigger cargo area, um, very high fuel economy, but the Civic's fuel economy is also very, very good. Um, and let's see here, fun to drive. So, you know, you could also look at something like um, the new Mazda 3 is, is very, very attractive and fun. Um, and it's not going to be too hard to, uh, to live with there. Uh, I need a daily commuter. Company pays for gas. I was thinking Lexus IS250 or the 2018 Honda Accord. I, for a commuter, I would probably Accord. Um, because it's going to be less expensive to keep around all, all the way around. So let's go ahead and do another drawing here. And we will give away the Supra thermos here. Ooh, that one's nice another, too. Another thermos for the new Supra there. I'll let you pick that one. I'll pick this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pulling multiple names out of here. There we go. And we have Dustin from Woodland, California. Again, we will send that email to you on Monday. Go ahead and pick another name out, and we will... I was kind of hoping for another Alex. I know. We'll see. We'll see. Not everybody has the best name. <laughs> Some people had to be named Robert. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with Roberts. Okay. They just couldn't be named Alex. Mm -hmm. Jose Villa from Westboro, Massachusetts. Ah, oh, congratulations. You, you got the JBL clip speaker. It's a Bluetooth speaker with a little carabiner clippy thing there. So we will uh, send that to you. There we go. So you can listen to our videos anywhere you go. And then we will pick one more for our last thermos. It's a Mazda thermos. This is Andy McCrab from Sterling, Colorado. Congratulations, you have a Mazda Thermos right there like that. And let's go grab another question out of the question queue. Okay. Um, 2020, 2020 Highlander Hybrid versus MDX Hybrid. Ah, very different hybrids, yeah. Um, the MDX is definitely more performance oriented. Um, I personally think if you're going to get an MDX, you should get the hybrid. Um, the hybrid system uh, has a, an interesting transmission in it. Um, but it's a lot smoother than the 9-speed that we find in the regular version, and you get better fuel economy. Overall handling is not quite as good because of the way the all-wheel drive system works in that hybrid. Um, and it doesn't have as, as solid of a track record, record for reliability as the Toyota hybrid systems, but it's going to be an awful lot more fun. That would be my thought there. Um, Ricardo would like to know, he says he has a Chevrolet Suburban 2017. Do you think it has a long longevity? Um, I don't think there's any particular problem with it. Um, you know, a lot of folks, for some reason, think that American cars have vastly different reliability metrics from the Asian car brands. But the truth of the matter is that, that very few problems really separate a, a, a reliable car from an unreliable car, quote unquote. Um, so uh, most cars will, uh, will, if maintained properly, oil changed regularly, all the scheduled maintenance done and cared for, that sort of thing, and driven with, you know, average driving behavior, um, will have absolutely no problem going over 100, 150,000 miles without any problems really at all. Um, you know, if, you, if you're really hard on your vehicles, if you skip those scheduled maintenance uh, appointments as recommended by the manufacturer, um, then depending on the vehicle, then you could start experiencing problems within that time frame, um, but not not too many. Um, so as far as the question someone was asking about our, our how do we do the giveaways, um, so we announced the giveaway last Friday um, that we were doing it. We announced what we were giving away, and then we had a video on our channel, which is now unlisted because we had to cut off at uh, 12 p.m. today. Um, and you just followed the instructions in the video. You emailed uh, the email address that was there. We printed your name out on the little form, and now we're pulling names out of the hat. It was also posted over at facebook.com slash alexnautos, but fear not, if you want to uh, dive into a future giveaway, we will have these regularly. We've, we've had them before. We've usually done them over at facebook.com. Um, now we've decided to move them over here to the YouTube as well um, and try and do this with a little bit more of a, 
um, entertainment uh, style thing. Uh, we'll also be giving away stickers. So uh, I've had this offer before and there are instructions down there in the description section. If you want an Alex on auto sticker, uh, these little guys are free. All you have to do is send a self-addressed envelope right there. So you put your own address on there, put a stamp on it, get the sticker. Uh, then you send it to the address that's down there in the description right there. It's a, a PO box right there in Redwood Estates. So uh, that processing does take a little bit of time, but in you know a week or two or however long it takes us to get to that, then the stickers will arrive in the mail. So let's go ahead and pull another name out of the hat. And uh, we have very random giveaways. Um, so we have... You want to give... We have a Mazda... We have a Mazda keychain. I suppose I could put on the wig. Is that what you want me? <laughs> there is for some reason. Yes, a, please. <laughs> there's a there's a wig on my wall. I don't remember what the wig was you for. You have to leave the nail in it. <laughs> no, there's no nail. In, we're not leaving the nail in the wig. I have no idea why there is a wig on my wall, but there is a wig on my wall. You At any like rate. Danny. <laughs> wow, we had to go there. You couldn't have just couldn't have just pick someone from the 70s. I had to go with little orphan Annie. Um, so here we go. So we have a Mazda keychain here. So this is our next giveaway. You want to read it? You want me to? You can read it. Chris Camer, sorry, Chris Camereri from Marietta, Georgia. Congratulations. We have that. And then you can go ahead and pull another name out of the hat and we'll start giving away hats. The, the hat giveaway from the hat. We have a bunch of them actually here. I feel like you should get you should pick the next one because okay. I've been doing a lot. So I'll pick one, you pick one, we'll give away hats. So Peter Rubio from Miami Lakes, Florida, you have a Fiat hat. Ooh. Congratulations. Jonathan Freeze from Temecula, California. You have a Jeep hat. Congratulations. Ooh. That right there. And uh, I'll get. pull on another one. We'll give away the other Jeep hat here. Dennis uh, from Houston, Texas. We have a hat right here for you. I want to take this one on this one. Oh, the wig is an upgrade, someone said. Uh-oh. <laughs> the funny thing about, uh, I think it might have been a hat very similar to this one. Uh, I always say I was born without a personality, but at the, uh, at the Fiat event where they were giving out hats, I was wearing my hat sideways like this. <laughs> and every time the Fiat PR person came around, he's like, wear your hat straight. And I'd always turn it back sideways again. Anyway. Who got that hat? Uh, this was uh, Peter Rubio from Miami. Peter Lakes, Rubio, Florida. that's how you have to wear your hat. Yeah, you that's how you have. Can't wear it any other way. It has to be sideways. And then a Michelin visor in case you want to play uh, poker. I guess that's what or you would. Golf. It looks like golf. Golf. Hat. A golf. Golf or poker. I mean, I don't golf, but that's what golf. What it looks like. Look like. Yeah. Do you want to? I'm picking it. But oh, you can go ahead and pick. I was grabbing tape. So I got excited. Okay. The visor goes to Walter Velez from Charlotte, North Carolina. Congratulations on the visor. There we go. And now we will dive right back into questions again while I put these hats away. Um, please rank current autonomous or near autonomous systems from the different manufacturers. Ah, okay. Um, there really are no autonomous systems. That's first, I, unless you're talking about safety systems. So there, there are autonomous safety systems right now where they will um, attempt to break the vehicle for pedestrians, cyclists, large animals, etc. On the autonomous safety system front, um, I think that the best performing systems so far that we've seen out there are from Mercedes and Volvo, um, and then a, a close, you know, next step down would be Toyota. Toyota's really done an awful lot of work on on active safety, um, and I would say that the as far as a, as far as corporate leadership goes, I've been most impressed with Toyota really uh, and their movement in active safety because they're they're putting all of those systems into even the absolute base trims and other manufacturers have really been forced to follow Toyota's lead. So they've had this major impact on the industry. Um, you've seen companies like Ford and General Motors and FCA and the Hyundai Kia Motor Group um, have to scrabble to try and, and, and start putting those features in their vehicles and Nissan as well. And, and now the, a lot of the industry has really been drug along by Toyota in this move. Uh, and Honda was fairly aggressive as well. Their systems are not as polished as Toyota's, and they don't always put them in the base trim. So while I'm while I'm happy that Honda's doing that, and they definitely have a good track record for safety, they're not pushing those systems quite as hard. Um, as far as on-road driving systems and the driving semi-autonomous systems, the two top ones would have to be 
um, Volvo and, uh, uh, sorry, not Volvo, Cadillac and, and Tesla in two slightly different ways. So Tesla's system is a, an eyes on the road, hands on the wheel system. It does, it is very aggressive with steering. It will do the lane changes. It will do the freeway exits uh, for you. Um, it doesn't drive quite like you might want to drive, but it's getting a lot better and there's a lot of continual updating on it. Um, the Cadillac system is the only system in the US right now where you don't have to have your hands on the wheel. Uh, so it has an eye monitoring system, a driver attention awareness system, and it's reading the lane lines and it will steer you along a highway um, until it either thinks that you're not paying attention or you get to where you wanna go or it can't read the lane lines anymore. So if you wanna hop on a freeway in San Francisco, drive all the way to New York and you wanna touch the wheel as little as possible, the Cadillac system is the only one that will do that for you. Um, the Tesla system, you're supposed to be holding the steering wheel at the same time. Um, and Cadillac is promising more aggressive updates to Super Cruise over the time. Um, oh no, that was me. Oh, that was you? That I thought I had me. something. I, thought, I was thinking I had part of that wig on my <laughs> nose or something. Um, Cadillac is promising more updates to Super Cruise over time, uh, and that system uh, is doing very well. Um, after that, I would say the, the major luxury players are definitely there. Um, Volvo and Mercedes have very aggressive systems. Um, so does Audi. Um, the uh, the systems that we find in modern Nissan vehicles are getting are getting there as well. Nissan probably has the most aggressive uh, auto semi autonomous steering setup in the mainstream category. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Um, just curious about the negative reviews about Subaru Ascent, especially with the transmission. Um, a lot of people don't like CVTs. Um, I mean, that's really just the fact of the matter. Um, yeah. People don't like the way that they feel. They, you know, for whatever reason. I mean, you drive a CVT. How do you feel about your CVT? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs oh, in the middle. Oh, I didn't realize that my car was a CVT. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> goodness. Um, I mean, in my car, I think I must have gotten used to it because I'm pretty comfortable with it. But the other day when I tried the Soul Turbo... Well, the DCT. A, oh, okay. Then, yeah, yeah. Didn't like that one. But okay. I anyway. like my car. HRV recommend to everyone. All right. Um, so, um, you know, it, it really depends on what you're after. The CVT is going to have a fuel economy benefit. It's going to have a performance benefit in something like the Ascent. Um, and it's the transmission that Subaru had. Uh, it didn't require more development uh, for the vehicle. So um, I don't find any particular problem with it. And if you don't like it, don't buy the Subaru. What do you think of the two-door Jeep Gladiator? Car and Driver posted a rendering on Twitter this morning. Um, it's interesting. I don't think that it's ever going to happen. Um, the Gladiator is big, and it's big for a reason. Uh, the, if you get a truck, a smaller truck, you're going to have to meet higher fuel economy standards, and that's why we don't really see any small trucks in America. When is the Mercedes GLB coming? Soon, we hope. That's what we're told. Do you think Honda will ever put their two point their ugh, I can't even speak, sorry. Do you think Honda will put their two liter four cylinder engine into the CRV platform? Um it doesn't seem I'm assuming you're asking about the two liter turbo would be my guess. Um it doesn't seem like that's gonna happen anytime soon. The CRV sells very, very, very well without a performance option, so I don't think that we're gonna see that. Any insight on the Honda one point five turbo issues? Um it's, I mean, as we've talked about this uh, a lot of times before, but there, it, it's difficult to see, it's difficult to really tell how many issues there are. This is not necessarily defense of Honda. Um, it's just when, you, when you're talking about so many engines, now that, you know, there are, there's this limited envelope, Honda says one thing, some people on the internet have, have enlarged this to perhaps seem like a bigger problem. Who knows where the truth is? It probably is somewhere in the middle. Um, in, in essence, Honda is saying that the problem is if you are in cold weather and you start your engine and you don't drive very far and you never take your engine up to operating temperature, that fuel can go past the rings into the crankcase and dilute the oil and that's the origin of this problem. And that anybody that drives their car up to operating temperature is never going to see this problem. Um, you know. How many problems there are, of course, we don't know, um, but we are talking about an engine that has been selling for a number of years, and Honda sells more than a million of those engines a year in the US. So it is by far one of the most popular new engines in America. Um, so based on its popularity, we could say that there are gonna be more problems with it than the Honda two liter turbo, because there are simply 
so many more 1.5s around. I mean, 10, 10 times the number of 1.5 liter turbos uh, sold in the Honda lineup. Um, so how big of a problem it is, I, we don't really know yet. Um, I have a 2018 Volkswagen Passat SE with Tech 2.0 turbo. Will this be reliable going forward? Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily unreliable, but I would say that, that it is important to remember that Volkswagen, generally speaking, is going to be a little bit more problem prone uh, in their vehicles than Toyota or Honda. Um, now, the, it's a 2018, so you do, have, you do have essentially a Toyota transmission in it. A lot of folks don't realize, but there aren't very many transmission manufacturers in the world. Um, and Ison is the manufacturer for Toyota. It's a, uh, mostly owned by Toyota. Um, and they make transmissions for Volkswagen, for Volvo, BMW, uh, even General Motors in some vehicles, et cetera. So, um, you know, the transmissions are all the same. So a lot of people are very worried about transmission problems for some reason. Um, but generally speaking, the Volkswagen is probably going to have some more, uh, more likely to have rather uh, electrical gremlins or some software funkiness or something like that. Um, than, than some of the competition. Let's move along to the hat again. We have other things to give away here. We have uh, helmets. I have no idea why I have helmets. So, um, <laughs> but they are, they are destined for the giveaway pile. Um, this is a, uh, this one's just a skull cap style helmet. It claims it's FMVSS 218 certified. I find that hard to believe. Um, but that is the claim on there. That is quite a small helmet, so I'm not sure who would wear that. Um, this one is supposedly a large helmet, but it is quite small as well. It is, it is a snug, <laughs> snug fit helmet. So um, I have no idea why I'm wearing it. Is this the name we pulled out or is this just a... It a, just kind of fell, kind of but fell I guess out. it's a sign. Oh, well, not a sign. Okay, either. here we go. Uh, Jin Zhu from Rancho Cucamonga, you have won the small helmet. So my apologies to you if this is a completely useless giveaway. Um, on the helmets, we will let you say no. <laughs> I don't know what we're gonna do with them. Um, if if someone says no, I guess we'll try later. It looks good, <laughs> maybe, it looks may, good. Maybe someone could give us, I, this is really tight on the head. <laughs> so if you have a head my size, know that this helmet may say large, it is not large. Okay, the next winner of the large helmet is Kelsey Dugan from Santa Maria, California. So congratulations, congratulations on the helmet. Um, hopefully Kelsey needs a helmet. I'm not sure why you would need a helmet in Santa Maria, but hey, maybe, ooh, maybe the wineries down there can get uh, a little crazy, get a little crazy later a little and you'll need crazy. the protection. <laughs> There we go. So now move along to the next question here. Okay. Um, when will the Jeep Wrangler get a diesel engine? It is getting it this year. And uh, I don't know when though, strangely enough. Um, it was announced before the Ram 1500 diesel, but I'm driving the Ram 1500 diesel Tuesday. I think Tuesday. Monday? Monday. Yes. Monday. I'm driving the Ram 1500 diesel Monday. Um, and it was supposed to kind of be second, so I don't know what happened there, um, but uh, it should be very, very soon. So they have finally sorted out all of the diesel drama with the EPA and the California Emissions Board, um, and it will finally really happen. Uh, I noticed someone just uh, chatted us there about uh, a BMW X5. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't see the name there, but Porsche Cayenne S versus BMW X5. Um, that's tricky. The Cayenne, the X5 in this current generation is definitely focusing a lot more on luxury. Um, and I really liked that. Uh, so I have to say that I really, really like the new X5, um, because it's very comfortable. It's quiet. Uh, it's serene. It's definitely quick in the X5, uh, 50i version. But if you're looking for something that's going to be sharper handling and more dynamic in that SUV format, that's not going to be the X5 anymore, oddly enough. The X5 was always the sporty one in that segment, and BMW really has sort of changed their tune over the last few years to kind of attack luxury a little bit more. Um, and I think that that's probably why I like the X5 a little bit more now than I did before, because I like softer sprung cars. Um, so, you know, I guess that really, it, it, it's up a little bit of, depending on what you want. Know that the Cayenne's gonna be a little more expensive, generally speaking. Uh, the X5 could be a little bit better deal. Um, Reliability is probably going to be pretty similar between the two. 
um, performance as far as acceleration and braking is not too far off between those two options, um, but handling is definitely going to be sharper in the Porsche. Uh, when do you think Toyota will bring Android Auto to the lineup? We know that it's coming. They've already announced the RAV4 will get it. Uh, when exactly, we don't know. We're told that the 2020 RAV4s will all have its standard and that 2019 RAV4s built after a certain date will have it as well. Um, but I don't know what that date is. So we will let you know if our RAV4 has Android Auto, I will find someone to test it. Um, but Toyota has not said whether they will have um, an update for the previous RAV4s or not. I would assume that they would because it's probably something that could be enabled in software. But Toyota's really cagey on some of those details, so uh, it, they're not they're not like like other manufacturers that have announced that yes, the software update will come. Uh, at this point, I should say, if you haven't already subscribed, be sure to hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. You can join. You can support us over at Patreon.com. Uh, Alex likes to get paid, so you know it uh, it helps pay her salary and everything else that that goes on here. Uh, I noticed there were a few other comments about ads and commercial breaks um, and how that works, etc. Um, I believe here with live shows, we end up getting commercial breaks even on YouTube Red people. That's what that how how that works. Um, it's just a YouTube thing. It's not under our control. Um, but I would say to anybody out there that says, but I pay YouTube for YouTube bread, you know, aren't you making money off of that? That's where I would say, no, we really don't make much money off of that at all. Um, if you are a YouTube bread person, it's great because you don't watch commercials. You pay, pay YouTube to not watch commercials. And then YouTube tells you that we will get a portion of that money. Uh, but I have to tell you that 25 to 30% of our views come from YouTube Red people, uh, Red, Red YouTube Red customers a month, but less than 1% of our revenue comes from YouTube Red people. So that's, that's what happens there. So, you know, you're, you're, you're paying $5 a month, but you're watching all these videos all month long, and YouTube is going to take the majority of that five bucks, and they're going to toss us maybe a tenth of a penny or something like that. So, you know, we get far more, um, far more money for the people that don't YouTube Red. You just watch a commercial, it makes makes us more money, and it makes all the YouTube creators out there more money as well. So I would strongly encourage you, just my personal opinion, um, if you're on the fence between YouTube or YouTube Red, renewing it or whatever, I would encourage you not to do that uh, for the sake of other creators out there as well. So especially if you're watching a lot of small channels like mine, where you know I have Alex and I have myself and I have a part-time videographer that will drag around here and there, and that's basically all that's going on here. Um, you know, or other bloggers out there where it's just one person and a camera. That's how they make their money. That's how they support themselves. So, you know, I, I, I'm not a commercial person, but I, since I have done this, I find myself going, okay, I will watch the commercials on YouTube. And I, you know, didn't used to. Anyway, so moving along from that. Uh, Lexus LX versus Toyota Land Cruiser. I would LX every time. Uh, I mean, they're almost identical. But everything about the LX is nicer. So, like the the bits that aren't identical, Lexus definitely has the market covered there, um, and they're about the same price. So why not why not Lexus? I know we talked about the Genesis G70, but I don't know if you covered this part. They just want to know what happened to it. It was so promising. I've yet to see one in the wild. Oh, <laughs> Genesis's problems were um, an interesting mix. So once you get the hat ready, while we talk about Genesis and find something to give away. Mm. I think there's something with forgotten to give away, but I cannot, it doesn't come to me now. So we'll just give away another Alex and Otto's t-shirt. Your, your, your signature beverages that you... We'll give away another Alex and Otto's t-shirt here. There we go. That's what we'll do. So while we're, while we're looking at the Alex and Otto's t-shirt giveaway, we will talk about Genesis and then we'll probably end the show. Um, the Genesis deal was interesting because Hyundai was initially trying to sell Genesis vehicles. This is more of a business related thing. Um, Hyundai was originally trying to sell vehicles through Hyundai dealers rather than creating a full-on Toyota Lexus model. So um, when Toyota set up Lexus back in the 80s, 89 was when the first Lexus launched, um, it was a very expensive launch. They had to create Lexus dealers. It took a, a long time to fill out the product portfolio uh, to get those dealers signed, and it was massively expensive. But Toyota was willing to spend the money because they made Lexus work. Uh, and that's how Lexus started. Um, 
Hyundai was trying to go to a middle ground where they didn't have to set up a completely separate corporation to set up completely separate dealers, etc. Um, franchise dealer laws are an interesting thing in America. The important thing to remember is when you go to a dealer, when, when you interact with a brand, Chevy, Ford, GMC, whatever the brand is, your main interaction as a customer is with a dealer, not with the car company because the dealers are independent franchised organizations. They've, they've licensed the name, they've licensed the right to sell the vehicles in your market. Um, oddly enough, I almost never interact with dealers. I'm almost exclusively interacting with the car manufacturers that aren't allowed to really do too much with the dealers. It's a very strange setup here. At any rate, the big deal here is when you create a new model of vehicle and you wanna sell it, it turns out it's very difficult to try and say only certain dealers can sell my widget. So that was the problem that Genesis ran and Hyundai ran into. They were trying to limit the number of dealers that could sell Genesis cars. The reason for that is luxury brands sell fewer cars a month than a mainstream brand. So while your Lexus dealer may sell hundreds of, or sorry, your Toyota dealer may sell hundreds of cars a month, the Lexus dealer may sell less than 100 cars a month. So you, you don't want as many Lexus dealers around. You want to cluster them in more urban areas where luxury vehicles are more popular, in markets where people will buy them, and you want them spaced out appropriately enough so that they can be sustainable. Um, and that's what Hyundai was trying to do. They were trying to limit the number of dealers that could sell Genesis cars. It didn't end up working well. Dealers sued. Um, Hyundai decided to try and, and, and go 180 degrees and then set everything up like Toyota did with Lexus back in the 80s. Um, and that process was very expensive and takes time. And it took about a year of down sales to get there. So the G70 was, was announced and ready and selling in other markets, but there was literally no dealer in America that could sell you one for quite some time. The Genesis issues have finally been sorted out. All the lawsuits have passed. The dealers have been compensated that we're suing and dealers sought contracts and the franchise agreements have been set up and, and, and gotten rolling. So now things are finally progressing forward and you should start seeing more Genesis models out on the road. But sort of at the same time, we've also seen a slowdown in compact luxury sedan sales, which is, you know, so the G70 models are definitely moving now and they're selling better than a number of other models in that segment. So we should see more of them. But I think you'll really start seeing more Genesis vehicles out on the road when the new crossover comes out. We're seeing the spy shots of that now. It may be revealed in November. It may be revealed uh, in early next year. But we will likely see that uh, on the road in America by the end of 2020. We have one more super chat question. Okay. How reliable are 2013 FRS slash BRZ and 2015 WRX CVT? The FRX BRZ, uh, FRS BRZ is definitely going to be more the more reliable option there. Um, the WRX has a few things going against it. Subaru's overall reliability generally tends to be a little bit below Toyota's reliability. The FRS and BRZ are, of course, that blend of Toyota and, and, and Subaru. They've proved pretty reliable. Um, the CVT could be a little bit less reliable than either the automatic or the manual uh, in the, uh, the FRS and BRZ. Um, and then the engine is, is also going to be a, a differing point in reliability there as well. So let's uh, pull the name out of the hat for the last shirt here. There was a question someone asked, and I was curious. Why don't we see Alex on autos? Like you laying out on them. That's what they were asking. Laying out on the car. I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't want to dent one. <laughs> you can pick this last one. Okay. Let's see here. And we have Mehar Aurora from San Diego, California gets a t-shirt as well and again we will email you on Monday to get the size of t-shirt and get that out to you and with that our live show is over so I would encourage you all to hit that subscribe button click the join button down there if you want to see our videos early we always post our videos early to our members nothing here at Alex Nottos is changing uh, as far as the regular videos go but you just get to sneak preview those videos a few days before everybody else um, and uh, find us over at facebook.com slash Alex and Autos and we will see you next week. Well, actually, sorry, we won't see you next week. I'll see you in three weeks. <laughs>